Hello, everyone, and welcome to part five of the AWIA Virtual Boot Camp, Building an Emergency Response Plan webinar. I'm Sean Taylor. Before introducing our speakers, I would like to welcome and encourage you to engage with our experts today by using the Q&A box located in the right corner of your GoToWebinar interface. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the last 15 to 20 minutes. Please note that all phone lines will be muted during this webinar. After the webinar is concluded, we will provide a brief survey about the webinar. Later, we will send an email with a link to watch the webinar on demand. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. David Totman, Vice President of Asset Management at Innovise. Becky Tomaszewski, Executive VP of Vision and Product Engineering at CityWorks. And Jason Channon, Senior Solution Engineer at Esri Water Practice. David Totman is the Vice President of Asset Management for Innovise, providing strategic direction for infrastructure systems management across the entire Innovise product line. He has been in the water industry just under 40 years and has applied geospatial technology to business process optimization, project analytics, and full lifecycle infrastructure management for over 30 years. Prior to Innovise, he was the Global Water Industry Manager for Esri, and served as the asset manager for Colorado Springs Utilities, one of the largest municipally owned forest service utilities in the USA. His state government service included water quality and water rights adjudications. He is a member of the American Water Works Association and the American Society of Civil Engineers. As an officer in the American Society of Engineers, he holds the title of past president of the Utility Engineering and Surveying Institute. Our second speaker, Jason Shannon, is the Water Utility Practice Solution Engineer at Esri. Jason has been with Esri for over 16 years, supporting water solutions. His recent focus is on helping Esri business partners maximize their solution potential on the ArcGIS platform, including the latest utility network foundations. Our third speaker, Becky Tomaszewski, is the Executive Vice President of Vision and Product Engineering at CityWorks. With over 20 years of experience in hydraulic modeling, regulatory compliance, and asset management, Becky oversees the future vision and technology for CityWorks suite of applications and platform. David, I will hand it off to you now. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, and and for uh, the introduction there of, of myself and Jason and Becky, and we've uh, been uh, excited to uh, kind of wrap up this this webinar series, you've you've heard us on some of the, the earlier uh, discussions. Kind of as I mentioned here, um, this has been a uh, a five part webinar series. Uh, thank you for all attending and and for looking at uh, the the recordings. Uh, uh, that's been uh, good good to see as well. And here today we're definitely you know wrapping up on uh, part five, um, building an emergency response plan. And <clears throat> when we put this. Uh, this webinar series together, we definitely had some ideas about uh, the emergency response plan, and 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 ideally, um, you know, we're going to have a focus on on flood, and and you'll see that uh, within within the webinar. But uh, of course, you know, we are um, in unprecedented times uh, with the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, I never in a million years would have dreamed of this. Uh, it's definitely, I say, say, some unprecedented times. And uh, I am quite proud of, of our, our company responses. Um, you know, Esri CityWorks and Innovise, we've all posted uh, on our websites uh, extreme support for all that you do out there. Uh, you know, uh, water is life and you are out there, you know, having to to keep, keep the water flowing. Um, you know, so we're trying to do our part with uh, keeping uh, our tools, making sure we, we're supporting you, that our, our online support staff are, are fully functional. We're doing a lot more online training, uh, having webinars such as these, um, you know, just to make sure that uh, you you can continue uh, to do your jobs. And, and if you are like me, been in the water for quite some time, you know, I have uh, friends and family uh, you know, asking is 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 it okay to drink the water? And 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 I say of course. Um, you know, uh, tap is where it's at, right? It's um, 
uh, all of our friends are, you know, make sure that, you know, based on all the, the currently available information, you know, the risk to the water supplies is indeed low, low. So, you know, continue to drink your tap water, no reason to try and, you know, uh, buy up all that bottled water. So again, we just wanted to take a, a quick moment to, to acknowledge, um, you know, the, the COVID and, and what that's done to our industry, but, you know, we still have jobs to do. Um, keep the keep the water flowing, and and we really thank all of you for what you do, and uh, you know just uh, uh, please uh, stay safe out there. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the webinar. So we're going to do a, a, a quick recap of uh, the previous webinars, uh, talk a little bit about emergency response plans, and then we're really going to break it up with uh, Jason from Esri talking about data, maps and apps, and, and Becky will talk about from CityWorks uh, various workflows and reports and, and also some analytics, and then I'll kind of get into analytics and modeling, and then of course um, really open this up for Q&A because this topic is such a huge topic with emergency response plans that we hope we get some really good questions and uh, you know, kind of uh, be able to fine tune some of that information uh, during the, the Q&A period. So with that, Sean, though, we'd actually like to go ahead and, and launch this polling question. You all should uh, be familiar with this, but uh, Sean, if you can do poll number one here. Thank you, David. And our question here is, have you already filed your AWIA certification? And if not, what size population does your CWS serve? So our first response is yes, we have already submitted our AWIA certification. No, we have not filed and we serve over 100,000. No, we have not filed and we serve between 50,000 to just over 99,000. No, we have not filed and we serve between 3301 to just over 49,000. And finally, don't know or NA. We'll leave the uh, polls open for 30 seconds and then show the results. Thank you. Now we do, um, we have talked about the deadlines and so we're roughly uh, six days away uh, for the largest of the utilities to be having, you know, filed their certificates of compliance. Um, so I know most of you uh, in that situation are, are already there. So uh, yeah, a little higher percentage have already then filed. That's good. Um, and others, yes, of course, you know, we still have until uh, end of uh, December of this year, end of 2020 for the, the kind of the medium to large and then until summer, uh, June of 2021 for the small to medium. So we still have some time. Um, so that, those numbers look uh, just about right. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and jump into uh, our webinar recap here. Um, when we kind of launched uh, the, the first webinar, we really talked about, you know, talking about the, this platform stack, the fact that, you know, Esri, CityWorks, Innovise, uh, you know, we're all kind of built on top of the Esri ArcGIS platform. We're all kind of pointing to the same uh, system of record, uh, which makes this an ideal uh, uh, solution stack, um, you know, to be all kind of uh, all talking about with the, the same data. Um, we talked about a lot of the, the resources out there. One of my favorites was, is this water ISAC, which is really a compendium of, of all of the major trade associations, uh, AWWA and, and WEF and, and others that, that all contribute to, to, to the water ISAC. So it's a great, great resource. Um, we talked about those certification deadlines again, March 31st, right around the corner. But uh, we've gone from we have been the uh, polling was around two to three percent have already filed, and I saw that jumped up uh, just to I believe it was seven percent. So that that's good to see. Those uh, deadlines are right around the corner, and and we were. Um, kind of mentioning the fact that, you know, we didn't have a huge focus on cybersecurity. We, the fact that Innovice CityWorks and, you know, built on top of the Esri platform. And, and if you're doing, uh, you know, with Esri's ArcGIS Online, it is, you know, FedRAMP compliant and such, but we weren't really kind of talking about the whole cybersecurity elements. And we encourage everyone, if you have cybersecurity concerns, uh, definitely the AWWA has a great, uh, resource under their cyber uh, security uh, homepage there. Moving on into additional webinars there, um, Jason talked to us about the physical asset registry uh, within ArcGIS and, and I kind of then also, you know, mentioned in, in Hydraulics 101 kind of the importance of having a hydraulically, you know, competent network uh, that, that gets, it gets us into these high fidelity, you know, asset registries with having uh, fittings and everything, uh, such that uh, you know a six-inch pipe 
uh, you know, if it has an eight inch valve, that there's actually a reducer connecting the two and, and how, you know, how the utility, the Esri's utility network and, and Innovise hydraulics all come into play with these high fidelity networks. Um, we turned a bit to asset management. And, and again, one of my favorite resources out there, the University of New Mexico has a really good, nice, clean uh, a website that gives you information about how to, to implement asset management programs. Um, the fact that I was a, you know, a member, an officer in the uh, ASCE, I couldn't help but uh, talk about the hazards tool that's built on Esri technology to, to understand some of the, the general hazards uh, that are in your area that would be quite germane to um, you know, the emergency response plan we're talking about. We had an entire webinar dedicated to CityWorks um, with Becky, uh, where we talked about enterprise asset management and the various workflows that are within the, the CityWorks uh, products. And then our, our last webinar, we talked about an asset management plan, the specific components uh, that went into an asset management plan. And this is coming from looking at, uh, gosh, dozens and dozens and dozens of amps. And, and they're all a bit different. There's no one standard, but these were some of the, uh, the common um, table of contents, if you will, that were in an AMP and how technology can help satisfy the content uh, within the AMP. Uh, I introduced kind of the concept of remaining useful life and there's a bit of a difference between, you know, uh, some of the basic linear regression techniques versus others that are kind of more of this, again, natural decay um, that many of our linear networks uh, serve. Once you put a pipe in the ground, it kind of has this natural decay function and all the types of information and analytics that go into understanding this, this remaining uh, useful life. And, and then we also talked about some of the tools Innovise to be able to do these decision trees that take you into a, a rehabilitation methodology and actually kind of uh, records uh, that, those audit capabilities. Um, so that's a, quite a, a quick, quick review of, of, of how we got to here today. And uh, we wanna talk about now uh, some of the elements, uh, components of an emergency response plan. So Sean, we're going to uh, turn back to you for another polling question about, uh, do you already have an ERP? Thank you, David. And again, do you already have an emergency response plan? Our responses are yes, we have a final ERP. Not yet, it's currently in development. No, we do not have an ERP and would like to talk about one. No, we are not going to develop a formal ERP and finally don't know. We'll leave the polls open for 30 seconds and then share the results. Thank you. Okay, and looks like we got some good responses here. So 32% of you said yes, we have a final ERP. Another 32% said don't know. 27% responded with not yet, it's currently in development. 5% said no, we are not going to develop a formal ERP. And then finally, 3% said no, we do not have an ERP and would like to talk about one. Okay, well, so that that's a, a a mixed mixed bag of responses. There definitely, you know, many of you already have the ERPs, and you may have probably already had it. You already had an ERP long before the OEA regulations came out. I know, you know, that was pretty much a standard issue at at Colorado Springs Utilities that we already had an ERP long before many of the regulations, because that's just really good business, right? Is to know what to do in case of emergencies. Now. I'll, I'll kind of guarantee that no one was really re preparing for COVID, but um, that, that's a whole different story. So, okay, so many of you already have your ERP, others are kind of working on it or thinking about it. So um, when it comes to this emergency response plan, and, and while we only have an hour to talk about all this, um, you know, we can't possibly come cover everything about an ERP. And, and so there's lots of great resources out there at the EPA. And of course, when you think about uh, emergency response plans and, and flood, you, you of course think about FEMA. Um, but also what I you know, find interesting is the Department of Homeland Security um, definitely has lots of lots of content about emergency response plans. And, and in the lower right hand corner is the really is the ReadyGov uh, website that talks about ERPs. And that's, that's a, a division of the uh, Homeland Security. And, and of course, uh, you know, AWWA, um, as I say, I'm a member of AWWA, we, we you know the M5 Water Utility Management Manual talks about ERPs, but they actually have a dedicated uh, uh, manual of practice, M19, that talks about that. And, and if you're AWWA members, you probably got the emails uh, that they're offering a, a full 
uh, utility risk and resilience certificate uh, program, uh, you know, that uh, offering specific training and some CEUs on emergency response planning. When you look at uh, ReadyGov, Ready.gov um, from Department of Homeland Security, they have a nice graphic here that just really talks about, you know, the, the, how to go into an ERP, right? So it really starts with identifying all the hazards uh, that are within your service territory, and you're wanting to understand the the probability and magnitude of these different types of hazards, which then you need to assess you know, uh, the risk um, and and understand, you know, which assets are at risk, which critical infrastructure and, and understand the vulnerability of, of your various infrastructure. And then of course, eventually you go into this impact analysis, right? And then and you'll see um, uh, both uh, uh, Jason and, and, and Becky kind of talk about that to, to some extent on this impact analysis, right? So if we go back to almost our very first webinar, um, and, uh, you know, talking about OEA, there was this emergency response plan requirements and we kind of, this is what's in the, the regulation itself and that got broken down into, if you will, you know, uh, a set of strategies, a set of procedures, uh, how do you mitigate for this and, and even then surveillance, kind of the monitoring aspects of that. And so we really want to kind of introduce these concepts of, you know, looking at data, maps and apps, workflows, analytics, modeling, and, and reports. And we all kind of will touch up on almost all six of these at any point in time um, as we're talking about that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and Sean, we're going to ask one more polling question and turn it over to uh, Jason. Thank you, David. And our polling question is, do you use Esri's Living Atlas in your ERP? Our responses are yes, we use the Living Atlas in ArcGIS Online. No, we do not leverage the Living Atlas. No, what is the Living Atlas? No, we do not use e Esri. And then finally, don't know. We'll leave the pulse open for 30 seconds and then share the results. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like we got a good number of responses here. So 30% of you said, no, we do not leverage the Living Atlas. Another 30% said, no, what is the Living Atlas? 19% did not know. 12% said, yes, we use the Living Atlas in ArcGIS Online. And then finally, 8% said, no, we do not use Esri. Well, uh, great responses. And I think that's exactly why we use that, ask that one question of, you know, what, what is the Living Atlas? So uh, Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you and take it away. All right, thanks, David. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining the webinar. Um, what I'd like to do is share some resources that are available to you all as part of your emergency response planning. And part of that is certainly the Living Atlas. So interesting to see that that not a lot of people are aware of this. So hopefully this will be uh, in, informational for you all. Um, ArcGIS includes a lot of ready to use content and we deliver that uh, through what we call the Living Atlas. And this includes base maps, it includes imagery, but it's really much more than that. It's, it's millions of authoritative maps, layers and data sets that are all available to you at your disposal to use in your maps throughout the ArcGIS platform. So the Living Atlas is accessible through many different ways in, in ArcGIS. The most common would be through ArcGIS Online. So if you log in, you use ArcGIS Online, really that information is just inherently there. When you search, you can find all of those layers. If you use ArcGIS Enterprise, then you can connect ArcGIS Online to your enterprise, to your portal, and then have that same access to the Living Atlas content through your own portal. And you can use that to add data, you can browse those layers, you can add them to your maps. You can also use them in analysis. So if you're doing analysis in ArcGIS Online, then you can bring those Living Atlas layers in uh, and do some of that. You can also browse the Living Atlas of the World website. So there are really great tools for browsing the information. You can see all of the metadata about how the information was collected, and you can also contribute to the Living Atlas of the World uh, via that website as well. Another way and a really common way to use the Living Atlas is through ArcGIS Pro. So using maps in Pro, you can bring those layers in, and again, you can perform analysis. An example of analysis with a Living Atlas layer may be overlaying pipes with the soil corrosivity layer that's in the Living Atlas to determine maybe some at-risk pipes. And there's also some uh, many different custom applications that are built by Esri and also by our users using the Living Atlas layers. 
So some specialized imagery applications, uh, an application called Hurricane Aware, uh, and one called the Drought Tracker, which um, drought, uh, tracks drought regionally um, by location. One example of the Living Atlas that I thought you all might find interesting is the National Water Model. Now this is a layer that Esri has curated from a couple of different sources. Uh, it brings in weather forecasting information from NOAA, as well as all of the real-time stream gauge information throughout the United States. So it features all of the streams and river segments in the US and can do up to a 10-day forecast as to the flow of those streams based on those conditions. And so you can see the graphic here is showing us over a 10-day period. The areas in blue indicate higher flow and the red indicating a lower flow. And so this is a really a, a great tool for you know, a first pass at any kind of flood prediction modeling and being able to see in real time what may be happening soon. Another powerful tool I wanted to share is something called infographics. Infographics are available in ArcGIS Online through Business Analyst. You can create your own uh, infographic reports and templates. And really an infographic just takes a simple polygon. In this case, it is uh, a water utility boundary area and then combines and enriches that polygon with all of the demographic information that you want to add for that particular area. So this is based on the disaster impact report. And you can see that for this water utility, there are household income, there are home values, there are housing year built, information about businesses, maybe health insurance indicators, uh, at-risk population, poverty and language. There are literally thousands of different demographic variables that Esri curates that you can incorporate into these infographics and enrich your particular area of interest. These infographics are also available in ArcGIS Pro. So all you need is a polygon layer. You have the polygon, you click on the infographics button, you can see that at the top of the ribbon there, and then you can choose from any of the templates. Now Esri has a whole bunch of templates and there are also templates that are shared out via the community. There are a lot of templates right now that are available uh, to support COVID-19 and really helping to understand the population for areas uh, that are served. Another tool I wanted to talk about is Hub. Hub is a really important tool in the system of engagement, and this allows for organizations to be able to share information very quickly uh, and also uh, in, in a really intuitive way. And so there are a couple of options with Hub. You have a basic version, which includes open data, and that version is, is free to ArcGIS online users, uh, and is really a great way to get information out there. But if you need to take that a step further and organize that information into initiatives and build website content and apps and things around that, or organize the sharing of information specific to communities and groups, then there's also a premium version of Hub. And right now we have um, literally hundreds of organizations across the, the world that are standing up Hub sites to be able to communicate information about their response to COVID-19. A really good example of an organization that has Hub is FEMA. So I would encourage you to take a look at FEMA's website and you can get to this Hub, just a quick Google search of FEMA Hub will get you there. And you can find that they have just a wealth of additional data that's available. They have lots of different applications. So as you're putting together your own emergency management plans, um, take a look at what FEMA has already out there for, for data and, and maps and applications. I also wanted to talk a little bit about solutions. In an earlier webinar, I talked about solutions for water utilities and covered some of the foundation solutions for building your asset registry. Uh, Esri also has a whole wealth of solutions around emergency management, actually probably more now than they have for even specific to water utilities. And so these are available via the website that's listed up there. Um, and I'll talk about some additional ways that you can take advantage of these different solutions. I wanted to just pick a couple of examples that I thought might be relevant to emergency response plans for water utilities. So some of those include looking at doing uh, vulnerability assessments for hazards, uh, sharing information out via a community impact dashboard, uh, doing damage assessment. Anytime there's a, a natural disaster, uh, damage assessment is, is very critical, and then capturing and reporting that information. Also sharing information publicly, being able to do that quickly and effectively. Uh, managing incidents, looking at things like critical facilities, 
doing hazard assessment analysis, and then overall situational awareness. So these are all examples of some of the, the templates and the workflow uh, applications that are available as part of those emergency management solutions that you can take advantage of for no additional cost. Wanted to highlight a couple that I really feel are, are, are important, especially for water utilities. And the first one is flood impact analysis. So this uh, is really a, a set of workflows and tools. It's not necessarily just one downloadable tool, um, but it helps organizations to prepare flood data. And that means looking at the science behind how that gets created um, using elevation and relief, uh, as well as a combination of other factors to look at what flood areas might be. Now, those flood areas can be different levels of flood uh, during different situations, or they can be things like coastal flooding. The tool gives you the flexibility to essentially build out flood areas and then also analyze those areas for the impact, what facilities, what critical infrastructure, what assets would potentially be impacted as a result of a flood of any type of magnitude. And then tools to also quickly share that flood impact information out to those both internally and externally that uh, will need that information. Another one that's more specific to operations for water utilities is water outage. So not every emergency at a water utility has to do with you know, natural disasters or those kinds of factors. Sometimes it's a matter of a, a really large main break that needs response. And so these are tools to report and investigate those water leaks, tools to be able to isolate the valves for a particular area and understand the impact of what that outage looks like, as well as sharing that information both internally and externally out to customers to keep them up to date as to what's going on. All of these solutions are available uh, as automated solution deployment through what we call the solution deployment tool. Now this is an add-in to ArcGIS Pro, so you install the add-in and then you connect to your mapping portal, whether it's ArcGIS Online or Portal, and then you can deploy the tool and connect to the catalog of solutions and then choose the solution you want. And then through a couple of clicks, you can deploy that solution into your ArcGIS environment. So lastly, I wanted to cover some resources that are available from Esri to help you as you, um, you know, prepare emergency plans, or if you're, you know, right now um, responding to and, and like everybody, uh, the COVID-19 situation. So certainly ArcGIS documentation. There's a wealth of documentation out there on our entire platform. Please read and take advantage of that. There are Esri white papers, some of them specific to water utilities. Uh, I mentioned the utility network in an earlier webinar, so we have a white paper on that getting started with your asset registry. We have ESRI training, both instructor-led and, and, and virtual self-paced training, all of it being done virtually right now. Uh, and then ESRI partners, so partners like Innovise and CityWorks, and then other partners that can also help you with implementation of technology or preparing for uh, emergency response plan. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is ESRI's disaster response program. So right now, obviously, those people are, are hard at work with responding to COVID-19. We have thousands of organizations across the globe that are asking Esri for help. Um, but even under normal circumstances, if you have an emergency or you need some, some help from Esri, the disaster response program is designed to be able to get you the software you need and the help from Esri to be able to respond to whatever uh, emergency is happening at that moment. So please uh, take a look at that. All that information is available right from the Esri uh, homepage. And of course, you can uh, reach out to me for more information as well. So with that, uh, we have another polling question. Do you use CityWorks to feed your ERP? And after the polling question, we will hand it back over to, we will hand it over to Becky. Thank you, Jason. And again, do you use CityWorks to feed your ERP? Our responses are yes, we use CityWorks data analytics reports to feed our ERP. We have CityWorks, but do not use it to feed our ERP. No, we do not have CityWorks. And finally, don't know. We'll leave the polls open for 30 seconds and then share the results. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like 61% of you said, no, we do not have CityWorks. 20% responded with, we have CityWorks, but do not use it to feed our ERP. 13% did not know. And then finally, another 6% said yes. We use CityWorks data analytics reports to feed our ERP. All right, Becky, take it away. Thank you both. 
Um, I have to say, those were really interesting results to me. And for those of you that are already using CityWorks to feed your ERP, we'd love to hear more about what you've done. And for those of you that have CityWorks and have not started using it yet for that, please feel free to reach out. We'd be glad to provide more information and help you get set up. So in the third installation of the series, we focused in on CityWorks and how the application is able to help organizations with their WIA reporting and regulatory compliance. I wanted to follow up on that and just talk again about some of that core functionality and how that ties into the solution overall. We still have the foundational solutions for asset management and permitting. And those are where the core activities are taking place that our clients are using and deploying in terms of tracking interactions with the public, work order activities, inspections, and health permits that are taking place as well as part of a ERP, such as what we're seeing today with the COVID-19 response among our clients. As well, CityWorks includes a variety of add-ons, and these are all focused on specific business needs and user profiles. And these as well play into how organizations are utilizing CityWorks in response for their ERP. Um, this includes the app applications such as Respond uh, for the work order management itself at the core, native apps out in the field to manage the field response and provide uh, field crews with access to functionality at their fingertips, storeroom to get into the management of those materials, and even personal protective equipment that's taking place to make sure that workers are safe as they're going about the response. And then I'll dive into a few more of these other applications as we continue on here. As I mentioned though, first off, I'd like to just talk about Respond a little bit more and how this can be used. Respond is really uh, the, the heavyweight in terms of the applications that we're looking at here. This is where we have the ability for our users to go in and start to manage service requests, work orders, inspections, as I mentioned. And specifically in the relation of AWEA and the ERPs that are focused more around the water utilities, um, I'm focusing here more on our AMS side. But PLL itself for the permitting and uh, health licensing also provides a lot of functionality that our clients are deploying and leveraging today right now as part of the ongoing response um, beyond what we're seeing for ERPs in relation to utilities. And so you can see here, we've got a few things just kind of highlighted up here on the screen. And one of them is specifically in relation to our project tracking. And so all these activities that are taking place can be associated back with a project that's then used for roll-up and reporting at completion of the event. As well, we have the ability to do the resource tracking. So in terms of knowing uh, the cost across all these applications and the events that are taking place, labor, equipment, material costing, and the association of crews by default for each of these activities to make the data entry faster and more efficient for those that are responding quickly out in the field. And to help supplement this as well, we also have a task workflow tool set. And this allows organizations to go through and document and define tasks that are specific to their SOPs. So this allows for specific steps to be documented and carried out while situations are sometimes chaotic and there might be crews that are responding that aren't familiar with the specific workflows and the asset types that they're dealing with when it's all hands on deck in a situation. As well, this also allows for routing and ensuring that there's documentation and receipt of when each of these steps are being carried out with date and timestamps. All this information that's being tracked here in terms of the type of activities, where they took place, the overall cost and the resources that were deployed with the date and timestamp information are then all available for that reporting process and rolled up into those projects that I mentioned as well that are being tracked on the forms. And this is all accumulated here in the CityWorks Project Manager. This is where organizations are able to go in and on the fly or in a, a pre-planned event, go through and create new projects that are used for tracking. This allows for creation of budget information, um, association of all those activities and overall reporting and viewing. And this really enables that ability to go through for that, just um, at the summation of the event, to have the accumulation of all the work and costs associated. And this is where our clients are using a lot of the heavy lifting as they start to get into information related to their FEMA reimbursements. And as part of that, also to assist those clients, we've created um, some templates in CityWorks that are built off the local government model for ESRI. We call them our local government templates. And within that database, we also have the default values for equipment usage, for example, for the FEMA reimbursement rates, separate of what an organization might charge um, for that resource tracking on a regular operational event. But this is a tool set that's um, part of the core functionality of CityWorks and allows those events to be created on the fly when they're not planned and not expected. And then there's also CityWorks Operational Insights. This tool is a, 
uh, essentially defined for the creation of asset criticality and prioritization. And oftentimes we see our clients using this to go through and identify those high risk assets or those that have a high consequence of failure in terms of long-term planning and capital improvement projects. But a benefit here as well is that once that criticality is recognized and those high risk assets are identified, it's able to go through and make note of that information so that when dealing in these ERP situations in a high risk event, you're able to focus in on those assets that have the highest criticality and will cause the most impact to residents should they be taken down and should there be a failure within the system and resources can be diverted and focused in to ensure that that infrastructure remains operational. And this information is being calculated uh, continuously using real-time information from your GIS based off the organization's prioritization of their own GIS data and how those fields play into how they calculate and identify which assets have the highest probability of failure, consequence of failure, and business risk within the organization. And then this information can be displayed spatially um, as well as within ArcGIS Insights for further analysis and then also in that reporting process. And then I mentioned Storeroom as well. This is a CityWorks application that's focused specifically on inventory management, which on a regular basis is very helpful for our clients. But when we get into event management with ERPs, we're able to go through and track and record the usage of all this material and equipment as part of that event, who it was issued to, who it was responsible for, and the units that were issued and dispersed. And this could be as simple as the event management tools such as road closure signs and traffic message boards that are being deployed to sites within the organization um, to ensure traffic is being rerouted and safety measures and notifications are being projected back to residents as they're traveling throughout the city. But this also takes place in terms of the PPE information, um, especially as we've seen now with the COVID-19 response and the necess necessity to ensure that all staff have personal protective equipment to keep them healthy and safe as first responders within these instances. And we can go through and track and make sure that respirators are being um, issued out to staff. Uh, safety goggles, glasses, gloves, all that information can then be tracked and ensured that it's being issued and responsible for to each of those employees that are uh, participating in the event. And then a crucial element here as well as our native apps from CityWorks. These are available in both iOS and Android to support a variety of deployments throughout our client base. But the real necessity here is the fact that they're able to be used in offline workflows. So we see quite often that our clients who are dealing with um, critical emergency events, one of the parts is that networks go down, Wi-Fi is not available, and it's necessary for those staff to be working out in the field in a disconnected and offline environment. And in that case, we're able to support Esri's mobile map packages and TPKs to ensure that those residents have, sorry, to make sure that those field crews have access to the infrastructure information still. They're still able to go through and process activities as are taking place and also to go through and create new work orders and inspections while they're in the field and working on the fly. So this allows them to go through and do uh, critical safety assessments as well and make sure that that information is being captured as part of the process and those follow-up activities that are being designated to ensure safety for the organization and for services for residents are able to be carried through. And then once those users are back in a situation where there is a, a connection available again, they're able to uh, do a sync and provide that information to the back office to make sure that resources are still being deployed and those activities are being carried out and documented. And then Jason mentioned a variety of tools from Esri. And one of the great things about CityWorks is that given the way that our app application is built on the platform of Esri, we're able to take advantage of a lot of those same solutions and technology that you mentioned. But another point where that comes into play is with our native apps and our mobile experience out in the field. Our apps have been architected to actually link with a variety of Esri apps, such as Collector, Survey123, Navigator, and Workforce for ArcGIS. That allows us to take advantage of those tools that Esri is creating, um, which is actually part of what we're seeing right now with the Esri coronavirus solution and how CityWorks is playing a role in that, leveraging the tool sets and cases that are already being created in Survey123, and that then becomes another field solution for those CityWorks organizations. Um, they're able to perform their work within the CityWorks native apps. If they need additional information in terms of the infrastructure that they're looking at when they're on the field and perhaps dealing with hydrants, valves, and mains, they're able to link over to Collector, view more of that asset information, perhaps provide attributes or make notes and edits, um, maybe even add additional points of interest as they're going through the process in the field. All this information then, because of our um, technology within CityWorks, is able to be generated into a feature service that can be shared and the ops dashboard for ArcGIS. This is something that's pretty common among our client base and part of the regular tool set that they're using within resident communication during 
critical events. Um, Ops dashboards is going through and showing all the, the calls that are being accumulated in from residents, work that's taking place in the field, what's in progress, where activities have already been reported by the public and are currently in progress in terms of the utility. And this information can all be shared as being updated in real time and can be made accessible as part of that communication process. And then at the completion of these events, a critical step here as well as reporting, being able to identify what work was done, where was it done, who performed it, how much did it cost the organization, and how does all this play into the long-term recovery efforts. And for that, CityWorks has a number of templates that have already been created and ArcGIS Insights. Um, CityWorks clients are able to load their database feed in and go through and immediately populate and hydrate these templates so for immediate access to visualization of the statistical analysis and the spatial analysis as well to identify where this work took place and use these tool sets and templates as part of the overall reporting process. And this is also a huge step in easing that communication for the reimbursement back to FEMA. And then in terms of how do you even get started with all of this from CityWorks? CityWorks has a number of resources that are available to assist with this process. Um, if you go to mycityworks.com, if you're an existing client, you can find some of our videos that, that have shown how our clients are dealing with emergency management with CityWorks, specifically during some of the hurricane events that have taken place in the Southeast. We also have white papers that we can distribute in terms of how to do your CityWorks configuration to support disaster preparation and emergency management. And we've also created new web training classes for disaster preparation. Um, these are pretty simple to go through and schedule, two, hour, two hours online through a web course um, for disaster preparation to help your organizations understand how CityWorks can be used today and what configuration steps are there and are available to help you with part of that process. And as well, if you have any additional questions or need more information, please feel free to reach out to myself or any of us at CityWorks. So next up we have our, I think this is our final polling question. So do you have a flood model, flood model currently in place today? Great, thank you, Becky. And again, do you have a flood model? Our responses are yes, we use an Innovise 2D flow model. Yes, we use a different model. No, we do not model flood risk, but should. And finally, don't know. We'll leave the responses open for 30 seconds and then share the results. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like 39% of you said no, we do not model flood risk, but should. 35% said don't know. 25% responded yes, we use a different model. And finally, 1% responded with yes, we use an Innovise 2D flow model. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone. Um, looks like uh, you know we, we have some uh, opportunity here to have some conversations on, on flood modeling. Uh, for, uh, for those few that use a Innovise 2D flow model, I appreciate that, thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead and uh, let's wrap this thing up. Got uh, want to try and uh, go through some of this pretty quickly so we can leave room uh, for some questions. So uh, again, we kind of you know there's a lot to cover with an ERP, but we wanted to focus in on flood. And like I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, Department of Homeland Security uh, is definitely jumping into flood, and one of the reasons is is because. Um, uh, whoop, wrong, wrong way there. There we go. Um, that you know, flood. Uh, Ninety percent of natural disasters in the United States involve flooding, right? And so, it, Homeland Security considers flooding as pretty much the number one risk uh, facing or number one threat facing uh, the United States of America. Then again, why, why the focus on on flood and and even our polling question on you know, are are you do you have a flood model now? Jason talked about the national water model, uh, and and uh, I was fortunate enough while I was at Esri to be involved in, in working with that, working with NOAA um, and the USGS. So it's really based on the National Hydrography Dataset, the NHD, which is is from the USGS, and it uh, really talks about um, you know there's there's 2.7 million rivers. Uh, in this database, because it's at one to 100 uh, K scale. Um, and the way they do the, that animation that, that, that Jason kind of highlighted there, the, the flow is they use a, a model called the height above nearest drainage, and it allows them to kind of take a look at precipitation events, 
where would the water go based on simply you know an elevation and they do some some math and some subtraction and they can kind of predict basically you know flood staging of these rivers and then and they project um predict these 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 forecasts they they spit out hourly 18 hour 10 day and 30 day forecasts and what they're finding is it it really um works within you know it, it uh inland terrain right so it's definitely kind of a little more mountainous territory you know um, where we have some sufficient slope if you will um so it's, but it's definitely uh, it seems to be very useful um with this emergency management use and again this is kind of a you know it's put out by NOAA uh at the uh, river forecast center and and it's it's published within esri um you know and so this national water model you can just you can just google that and you'll find lots of information and of course it's being fed by real time data right so the these uh unit hydrographs that are they're published across these thousands of gauges that that uh Jason was kind of talking about you know it it's all connected now uh, they are working hard at increasing the resolution, going from 100K scale to 24K scale, which though ups it to 26 million uh, river reaches, if you will. Um, and so not all of them always have water in them. But anyway, so that's a little bit more about the national water model that is available to you uh, in our collective uh, platform for, for doing the, your ERP. So, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about, you know, uh, flood modeling. Um, so, so Jason was kind of talking about that, the, the polygons there. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that, that blue polygon. And I wanted just to do a quick kind of back to, you know, uh, flood 101, if you will. So there's a couple of terms you'll hear out there, hydrologic versus hydraulic. Um, and really, you know, hydrologic is really think of all things Mother Nature, right? It's 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 about you know uh, rainfall and and water that 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 covers uh, you know over land. And hydraulics is really kind of think of it inside pipe. Now hydraulics can be within a river channel as well, um, but really it's you know kind of uh, think rainfall and then the mechanics of of water flow in a pipe, if you will. Um, then there's a pluvial versus fluvial. So pluvial, you know, is 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 rain and and fluvial is river. So you can have flooding uh, in a parking lot, right? If there's sufficient rainfall. And and so again, we when we talk about modeling, we kind of talk about some of these differences. Um, steady state versus dynamic state. Uh, steady state models kind of have to assume that you know constants are uh, the variables are constant, right? So they're not really variables; they're they're constants. You kind of have this perceived uh, steady state concept, whereas the more advanced models, um, and we kind of asked about the 2D flow, um, you basically you actually model the variability up to that kind of steady state value, right? Because most rainfall events, you you have a bit of rain, it starts to, to rain and then it increases and you have these kind of these peak flows that come through these, uh, these river systems. So it's very important to understand uh, using a dynamic model. Um, Accuracy versus precision. So if we take these two uh, two plus signs, these two crosses, if that was a, a sign of of truth, if you will, you know these dots uh, around the left cross there, they're they're fairly accurate. Um, but these dots in the right cross, you know, they're they're very precise, but nowhere is near accurate. And so that blue polygon that Jason was talking about, you kind of want to make sure that blue polygon is accurate because um, that's what you're basing uh, your response upon, right? Um, it's better to be accurate than precise uh, when you're dealing with human lives and saving property. Um, there's also high fidelity versus low fidelity. So uh, think of these two images here, um, you know, with high fidelity, you have a high fidelity terrain, right? You have, you know, high resolution, especially these days with LIDAR. It's very important to understand when rainfall uh, falls upon the land, where is it going to flow? If I have a low low fidelity model, you know, it could just about go anywhere. So you really need some of that that high quality data. And what's been interesting um, out there is, you know, this this do it yourself versus the provider services. We've all been talking about, you know, a commercial off the shelf, you know, software, right? That uh, you can configure our software and be up and running fairly quickly. Well, there's also actually quite a few providers out there that offer uh, flood data, uh, and actually flood results you know, for a fee. I was, I was a bit surprised at how many, um, you know, companies are out there in the, in the flood business and they all have their own science of choice, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for sale, if you will. 
All right. Well, Jason talked about that flood impact analysis, right? He, we had this slide here and if we kind of focus uh, what was on uh, that screen and, you know, kind of look a little bit closer and zoom into, if you will, to that blue polygon. There's a lot of science that does, that goes into that polygon, right? And, and you'll start to see this urban setting. And this is where we actually start getting into stormwater infrastructure as well. Um, right. And so part of the ERP is about mitigation circumstances. Do you have a, you know, a, a, an active stormwater management program with infrastructure uh, that is definitely, you know, uh, kept up uh, to date? And so one of the things that we have uh, in Avise is a, is, a, is a model built on top of ArcGIS um, InfoSwim, and it's based on the stormwater management model or the SWIM uh, engine. Uh, you can look at the Wikipedia definition, it's quite long. Um, I'll let you read it from the, uh, the downloaded version of the webinar, but it, uh, SWIM comes from the EPA. Uh, it's been around for, for many, many years. Um, it, it gained FEMA approval in 2005 and then uh, introduced these lid controls in 2008. And you're probably, well, what's a lid, Dave? Um, that gets us into kind of our acronym soup, uh, that, you know, best management practices or BMPs, low impact development, lid, right? These lid controls. Um, which gets us into the whole world of green infrastructure and the sustainable urban drainage systems or SUDs. And SUDs um, actually, uh, you know, within the US, but also quite prevalent uh, uh, with our customers over in the UK. And all of that kind of feeds this conceptual uh, program, if you will, the system for urban stormwater treatment and analysis integration or sustain. So what does all that mean? Well, one of the things um, that we do at Innovise and we, we believe we do quite well is we we can have a dynamic model for you know rainfall and runoff, right? So as that rain hits the ground, what is it going to do? How is it going to build up? Where is it going to go? Um, even uh, into your infrastructure, you know, do you have sufficiently sized culverts? Uh, to carry those outflows, right? So this is all built, let's say, within the ArcGIS environment. And when I talk about uh, that, those SUDs, the Sustainable Urban Drainage System, one of the things about the ERP is these mitigation measures, you know? And one of the things that, that are coming into play is actually, you know, Mother Nature has been doing this for quite some time. Um, and so some of the uh, natural infrastructure does a pretty good job at uh, mitigating uh, flood impacts. And so uh, some of the things you can do is actually do engineering design and put a bit more mother nature back into your design. You see in this diagram, you know, the, there's kind of these storage ponds and of course there's infiltration into the groundwater, but you can put in these, these grassy swales. So not only are they uh, kind of attenuate some of the flow, but they also help with water quality, right? So as, as that water is flowing uh, overland, uh, hits the streets, goes into the gutters, goes into the sewers and, and takes it away. If you do this in a mindful fashion, you, you have this sustainable urban uh, drainage system, which we also innovise uh, support. You know, one of the things we get into uh, about the uh, the lids, though, is also just actually what are the economics? You know, there's at times it's cheaper to put in some of these these natural engineered structures, if you will, and you can kind of take a look at the cost effectiveness of you know using natural uh, detention as opposed to lots of uh, gray uh, concrete out there, right? So you can do that with this our our tools um, and urban stormwater analysis. Now, uh, we, we did talk about uh, it's better to be accurate uh, at times than precise, but you can also be both. And when we get into really high resolution 2D flow modeling, it really starts to understand the exact flows uh, that are happening at a very micro level in between buildings, uh, just exactly where is this water going to pond, where is it going to flow, uh, gets quite complex. And then you can actually go into you know, live real-time modeling, right? So as these precipitation events are happening, um, you know, what is, where is this water going to go? And we can actually stage it with very quick real live time, you know, real modeling, and even then spin off other models that will model exactly, say a particular catchment, and then feed that back into your operational response model, all right? If we go back to the ERP uh, and look at kind of the main requirements that were in the AWEA ERP requirements, 
and we broke that down to you know the strategies, procedures, mitigation, and and surveillance, if you will. Well, uh, strategies. Uh, Jason touched on those. Becky touched on those. I'm touching on those a little bit about this flood planning, response, and recovery. Uh, uh, there are tools available to help you uh, in building some of that out. Uh, procedures. Uh, Becky talked about definitely in uh, you know in the enterprise asset management system there are workflows and package job plans that uh, you know help you respond to these procedures and built-in FEMA reports right that help you respond and 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 procure funding uh, for some of these emergency response uh, procedures and then from a mitigation that kind of talked very quickly uh, about suds but there are ways you can actually use mother nature and and stormwater uh, containment to to mitigate some of the flooding impacts and then last but not least you know from the surveillance perspective um, Becky talked about IOT uh, Jason mentioned the stream gauges, those unit hydrographs that are coming out of the national water model. All those things can be brought together in the Esri CityWorks uh, Innovise platform. Um, and, and of course, technology kind of uh, plays a role in each of these. Hopefully we showed you a, a little bit of that uh, uh, today. So with that, um, I think we have just a couple of minutes uh, for some questions. And uh, we're going to open up the mic for Jason, Becky, and myself. And I see a handful of questions here. Let's see. We're going to start off with um, Jason. This first question is for you. Uh, let's see. The Living Atlas. Is there a cost for using these Living Atlas layers? Really good question. Um, for most of the Living Atlas layers, there's no additional cost. For using those inside of ArcGIS, but there are a couple of premium layers, and those happen to be some of the demographics and the tapestry. Those do require they, they utilize credits. Um, also, when you use those layers with analysis, if you're doing the analysis in ArcGIS Online, you may incur some credit costs there as well. And then the infographics, um, when you use those, those may incur a little bit of credit cost as well. But for the most part, most of the Living Atlas layers using in your maps, no cost. Okay, good. Uh, looks like this question, Becky, is going to come your way. Um, sounds like CityWorks is running on the Elgin, the local government information model. What happens if an organization migrates to other information models for a water outage solution or, say, even the utility network? Uh, CityWorks supports those other models in, in terms of the outage solution and the utility network both. And so for those clients, it's just a matter of going through and as they complete their database migration um, and change their schema, their CityWorks information all still stays intact. Um, they shouldn't anticipate that they're changing their of their assets as they're going through that process. And we do have tools that manage the naming convention as those feature services that CityWorks is looking at are migrating. Okay. And uh, well, uh, while while you're while you're there, the um, another question. Again, uh, you know, our our users are always concerned about costs. Um, are the CityWorks add-ons an additional cost? We have an enterprise license for AM, but not PLL. We have a group that uses Storeroom, but I don't think we use any other add-ons. But seems like we could make use of them. Comments about that? Um, there's a lot of options and variations in the licensing, licensing model. Um, there's different levels for the enterprise license, such as uh, standard, essentials, and premium. And so it's hard for me to know off the bat without being aware of the exact licensing. Um, many of the add-ons that I showed are already included in that standard enterprise license. And so depending on where your organization falls, you may already have access to these applications and just not have awareness of it yet. Um, but feel free to reach out to me and I can help you find out for sure. Uh, my email is listed here, but another one that also works that's a little bit easier is beckyt at cityworks.com. Um, so feel free to reach out and we can help you identify that. And if not, we can try and see what we can do to work with you to provide access to those other ap applications as well. Okay. Um, great. I, we're just about out of time, but there's one last question that I, I find. Um, there is a... Oh, I just had it. Um, is there a data that shows a change in a utility's insurance coverage or premiums when they invest in asset management tools? I guess that's to all three of us. 
So if they deploy asset management, is, is there data out there that shows that their insurance coverage could actually be reduced by being proactive with asset management? Any thoughts? Interesting question. I mean, I, I haven't heard of anything specifically, but I certainly think it makes, you know, having those plans in place and, and having all of this is certainly more defensible for, for lowering costs. Yeah, I definitely know with a lot of the investment boards I work with and such like Moody's and Standard and & Poor and Fitch, um, they definitely are starting to tie your bond ratings, right? Um, the it's we all you know uh, when i was at the utility we were quite proud of our our bond rating and did everything we could to protect it because that literally literally results in millions of dollars in interest savings if you have a good bond rating and so uh the the main the main investors are definitely looking at whether you have an asset management plan or not right they just simply want you to what do you have what are you doing and are you financially prepared for the future um definitely has an impact on your bond rating so I, I definitely know it affects your bond ratings. Don't, don't know if it affects your insurance, but uh, that's a great question. Something I know I'll, I'll kind of take a look into. So I think, uh, Sean, uh, we got some more questions, but um, unfortunately we're out of time. We'll definitely answer all of them. Uh, get back to you uh, for sure on that. And uh, thank you so much for, for attending today's webinar and, and for those that have been with us for all five webinars. Um, this has been a great learning experience. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, talking to all of you and and definitely uh, stay safe out there. I can't wait to see many of you, um, you know, at uh, at the trade shows uh, once once it's safe to do so. So um, I think with that, Sean, I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap us up. Yes. Thank you, David, Becky, and Jason. We would like to thank everyone for attending today's session. If we did not get a chance to answer your questions today, we promise to get back to you with an answer. Before you go, we are going to provide you with a brief survey about today's webinar experience in your GoToWebinar interface. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.